So, uh, this was a, this is a joint work with Stephen Galbraith, who was formerly at um, Admiral Holloway, was my uh, PhD supervisor. Um, and apologies for the very long title. Uh, that was due to a, um, a referee suggesting that the previous name was wrong. Um, but in fact, essentially, we're working on the, the DLP in a short interval. That's really what it's about. Okay, so the outline of the talk. First, we'll introduce the problem uh, and hope to motivate it. Um, then we'll describe the, the Godishos algorithm for solving that problem. And then I'll explain our improvements to the standard Godishos algorithm um, in specific groups with fast inversion. Um, and then, if time allows, some experimental results and then conclude. Okay, so the DLP in a short interval, essentially it's the DLP, except that instead of the discrete log being between 0 and the order of the, the order of G, it's now between 0 and some, oh, sorry, minus N over 2 and N over 2. So it's a lot smaller interval, okay? Uh, hence the name DLP in a short interval. That's really what, uh, what this problem is. So really what you're after is you're after an algorithm that instead of, just being a standard solving the discrete log algorithm, you want something that can solve this specifically. So that rather than using a standard algorithm, you use one which speci uh, specifically solves this problem. Okay, so uh, this problem arises in a number of uh, contexts. So, for example, the DLP with uh, C bit exponents, uh, decryption of the Bonnet Go Nissim homomorphic encryption scheme, counting points on curves or abelian varieties over finite fields. Analysis of the strong Diffie-Hellman problem and side channel or small subgroup attacks. So it does appear in a number of places. Okay. So now, uh, going on to the running time of a number of different algorithms for solving this. So the first one is obviously the baby step giant step, which solves this problem in O of root n time and space. Of course, it's not a low memory algorithm. Um, and the average case expected running time is approximately root 2n group operations. So that's not the low-memory algorithm, and really what we're after is a low-memory algorithm for solving this problem. So the low-memory algorithm for doing that is Pollard's parallel, parallelized kangaroo algorithm, or the method of Van Orschot and Wiener, uh, which solves this problem in approximately two root n group operations. So that's the well-known uh, algorithm that's been out there for quite a while. And recently, Pollard has improved his, his kangaroo algorithm to achieve 1.71 root n group operations. Uh, and also, we've made some improvements to the standard go schoss algorithm, which reduces the running time uh, to 1.48 root n group operations. So both these last two results are very new, and will hopefully will appear in a forthcoming paper. But all of these algorithms, they solve the, the DLP in an interval in, the stand, in a generic group, in any group. So we want, we want to motivate this problem, see if we can solve it quicker in uh, specific groups. So in particular, we worked on groups which had fast inversion, inversion. So what we mean by fast inversion is that if you have an element u that belongs to the group, then calculating the inverse of u, u inverse, is much faster than a group operation. That's what we mean by uh, fast inversion. So a simple example of this is obviously the group of points of an elliptic curve over a finite field. So in particular, when you have fast inversion, if you know the discrete logarithm of an element, then you very quickly know the discrete logarithm of the, the inverse of the element. And because you have fast inversion, you know the, the inverse as well. So we were hoping that you could use equivalence classes in some way, equivalence class consisting of an element and its inverse, to somehow speed up some of these algorithms. Okay, so obviously we went to the... Uh, the original algorithm to do this, that was the kangaroo algorithm. Um, and contrary to a claim that was made in, in the handbook of elliptic and hyperelliptic uh, curve cryptography, uh, and I, I stress it seems impossible to uh, implement equivalence classes on the kangaroo algorithm. I stress seems, so if someone else can do it, then uh, I'm happy to be proven wrong. Um, so instead, what we decided to do is we decided to see if we could implement or use equivalence classes in some way in the goldie schoss algorithm, which I'll explain in a moment, to speed up solving the DLP in an interval in groups with fast inversion. So let me quickly explain the goldie schoss algorithm for in solving this problem in a generic group, and then move on to when we have fast inversion. 
So the Godishaw's algorithm works in the following way. You have a tame set T and a wild set W such that you know the discrete log of every element in the tame set, and the tame set is between minus n over 2 and n over 2. And the wild set is a, is a set of the same size as the tame set, but translated, centered on the element that you're trying to find the discrete log of. So you know, every, you know the discrete log of everything in the tame set, uh, but you don't know the discrete log of everything in the wild set, except that you know where it is in relation to the element that you're trying to find the discrete log of. So I've got a little diagram on the next slide. Uh, and in a similar method of the Van Orschot and Wiener method, uh, you have tame walks, which walk in the tame set, and wild walks, which walk in the wild set. And what you're trying to do is find a collision between a tame walk and a wild walk. So diagrammatically, I thought a diagram would be the best thing to show here. Uh, the tame set is the black rectangle at the top. So it's between minus n over 2 and n over 2. And I've uh, shown the wild set for a number of different problem instances. So the first one is the worst case. That's a problem instance where the, the element that you're trying to find the discrete log of is equal to g to the minus n over 2. So it's at the left-hand extreme edge of the tame set. So what I've done is I've translated a same size set as a tame set around that point. Hence, you get the, the first um, shaded rectangle where it says the worst case. And you can see the overlap between the tame set and the wild set in that case is quite small. Okay? And so as h, our element that we're trying to find the discrete log of, moves down the tame set, so we're moving to the next stage, so where g is, h is equal to g to the minus n over 4, you see that the, that's the average case and the overlap between the tame and wild sets is increasing. And it increases all the way to the best case where h sits in the middle of the tame set. And when you have the largest overlap, you have the sl um, smallest running time. Okay. So before I just explain the, uh, or give the running time, I have to explain uh, distinguished points. When you're doing an algorithm like this, which is, you want to keep it low memory. So what you do is you have a number of, you have multiple walks, multiple tame walks, multiple wild walks. And just as you think of, uh, consider the kangaroo algorithm, what the kangaroo algorithm does is it, its tame walk walks until it hits, uh, until you've decided to stop, and you save what's known as the trap, the thing at the end, uh, the, the, the element and its discrete log at the end. So in this case, you have multiple tame walks, multiple wild walks, and you, you set a certain subset of the group as being distinguished. So a simple way of doing that, for example, could be if you, um, if you consider the elements as they're in their binary form, you take the first L bits to be zero, and you call that a distinguished point. And we can decide, you, you can decide on how large or small L is, so hence deciding what's the probability of a point being distinguished. And so when a walk hits a distinguished point, the, the algorithm sends the uh, element and its discrete log to the server, uh, and the walk then starts somewhere else. So here I've just said theta is the probably distinguished point. You don't need to worry about the last paragraph. I should have removed that. Okay, so the algorithm, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, was... So as it's a parallelized algorithm, you can, you can run it on uh, multiple uh, machines. So you have NP processes that work on, that work on this, Half work on the tame walks and half work on the wild walks. So a tame processor starts a tame walk by picking a random point in the tame set, walks a number of steps until it hits uh, a distinguished point, then it sends the distinguished point and its discrete log to the server. The server then checks, has it seen that point in the wild hash table? As in, has there been a wild walk that's hit the same distinguished point? If it has, you've solved the discrete log. However, if it hasn't, what it does is it then uh, so stores that uh, element and its discrete log in the tame hash table and starts the tame walk uh, from another random point from the tame set. And the wild uh, walks are analogous to this. They start somewhere in the wild set and so on and so forth. Okay, so to analyze this algorithm, we use what we call the tame wild birthday paradox. It's very similar to the birthday paradox with a, uh, a few minor uh, changes. Um, and the running time of the algorithm that I've described by averaging over all problem instances is 2.08 root n group operations. So, of course, that's slower than the Pollard kangaroo algorithm. Uh, but with the improvements, we've made this as low as 1.48 root n, and again, that's to appear in a forthcoming paper. Um, but we're trying to say, can we go further than this in groups with fast inversion? Okay, so now I'm going to describe the algorithm, the improved Godishoff's algorithm, where we utilize equivalence classes in groups with fast inversion and see if we can improve on that. Okay, so first, 
an obvious example uh, is, the, is elliptic curves. So elliptic curves obviously are fast inversion. And for what we're trying to say is if I give an element, if I have an element Q um, with its discrete log n, which happens to be in the interval minus n over 2 and n over 2, then the inverse of Q minus Q has its all discrete log minus n, which is equidistant from the center of that interval. Okay? So if Q sits over here and the center is over here, minus Q sits equidistant from the center. So if you know Q and its discrete log, you automatically know minus Q and minus n. So it's obvious to take the equivalence class Q and minus Q. So it's natural then uh, to perform random walks in rather than uh, elements, but random walks in sets of equivalence classes. Therefore, our tame and wild sets become the following. So our tame set is uh, T and wild set W. So the old tame and wild sets were of size n plus 1, or approximately n. Uh, and in this case, because you're now walking in equivalence classes, uh, the equivalence class is number n over 2 instead of n. So you're halving the tame and wild sets. And that seems great. So are you in, it's, it's, it seems that you are going to get an instant improvement, but it's not as easy as that. Okay, so diagrammatically, and here's the issue, if you see it diagrammatically. So the tame set, if we map the tame and wild sets to just uh, the positive side, then the tame set is given by that rectangle there, so, so size n over 2. And in the best case, where h is uh, equal to uh, g to the 0, the wild set is also of the same size. However, because we are now working in equivalence classes, as h moves to the right, as we move towards the average case, rather than the wild set being a translation of the tame set, the wild set starts increasing in size. Okay? Um, the, uh, the crisscross shading is uh, meant to describe different densities of walks, because if you consider the wild set now goes, the, in the average case, goes a bit into the negative and obviously maps over when you take the positive the equivalence class, you now have different densities of searching. So the density on the crisscross shading is higher of searching than on the right-hand side where it's just a single shading. And as H moves to the right of the, of the tame set, so where H is equal to G to the N over 2, you then have the worst case where the wild set is twice the size of the tame set. So we did some... So we analysed this algorithm, and it did give us an improvement on the 2 root n. didn't give us an improvement on the 1.48 root n group operations. And we thought, can we do any better than this? So we decided, rather than searching in the whole of the wild set, or what we described as the wild set before, we decided, is there a way that we can search in a smaller wild set and achieve a better running time? So let me just go back again quickly. So as I said before, the running time it depends on the overlap between the tame and wild sets. So if you look at the average, in the worst case, you're wasting a lot of walks in the wild set. They're completely wasted. So can we change where we walk in the wild set such that we're wasting less uh, walks? So what we decided to do is we decided to, sorry, we decided to, there we go. We decided to search in a smaller wild set. In fact, instead of searching where A belongs to minus N over 2 to N over 2, we decided to go from minus N over 4 to N over 4. So we're halving the size of the wild set in the, in the uh, best case, or in the previous best case. So does this give any further improvement? So again, good to look at a diagram to see what's going on in the different cases. So again, I give you the tame set, which is the uh, black rectangle. And the previous best case is now not the best case anymore. The wild set is now half the size, but you're now doing double the amount of walks in that half the size. But you're not wasting any walks. You're wasting some tame walks, none of the wild walks anymore. And as h moves towards the right, so if h is a g to the n over 8, so that's the new average case, there's some different densities of walking, but again, you're wasting less walks. And you have the, the overlap is the size of the wild set. And then the new best case, g is equal to, uh, so h is equal to g to the n over 4, you now have no different densities of walking, you have a full overlap, that's why it's the new best case. And at that point, because you're only searching n over um, between minus n over 4 and n over 4, at that point the wild set actually starts moving as opposed to being bigger. So the wild set's never any bigger than the tame set. And this seems to work better. Okay. So 
We used a slightly different form to the birthday paradox of the uh, Godi Shostak with, and taking into account the different densities of walks, because even with a smaller wild set, you do have different densities of walks. Uh, the expected running time of the improved Godi Shostak algorithm was 1.36. Uh, root n group operations, which is slightly better than 1.48 root n. But there are a few issues with walking in equivalence classes as opposed to walking in elements, and I'll describe two of the issues uh, that we had to deal with. Okay, so the first issue, which is easily dealt with, is that when you're trying to do a deterministic pseudorandom walk on equivalence classes, the first thing you need to do is you need to decide which step, which element of the equivalence class am I going to walk from? And it needs to be deterministic. So a simple way of getting around that is we said, let's, let's walk from the element with the largest uh, y-coordinate taken as an integer. So that was an easy fix. So the first thing you do when you walk in equivalence class is you decide, am I going to walk from uh, this element or that element? Because you don't know which one's actually, uh, which one's negative. Okay, then the next issue is cycles. So as in the original go to algorithm, all our steps are positive. Okay? However, with the walking in equivalence classes, because the first thing you do is you decide, am I going to walk from the left element or the right element of the equivalence class, is you end up with side-to-side -side walks. So let me give you a quick example of how that, um, how that happens. Say we start a walk from minus 13, 13, and we decide to step from minus 13, or that's how our deterministic rule decides, and we have a step size of plus 4. Then we end up as at minus 9, 9. But if we then decide to step from, or deterministically, we step from 9 in, instead of the negative side, which, can, which does happen, and we happen to use the same step size of plus 4, you end up back in a cycle. So that's actually a two-cycle, and that does occur quite frequently. In our experiments, they occur very frequently. So there has to be a method of getting out of a cycle. So that phenomena was... Uh, noted by Gallup, Lambert, Vanstone, and Wiener and Zuccarato. And what it, if you, once you enter a cycle, it can cause walks never to hit a distinguished point. And so you have to have another rule for having a maximum length of a walk uh, to get out of that, that cycle, but that means you've wasted the entire walk. And given that these two cycles occur frequently, you don't want to waste all these walks that you're doing. So the way to get around this is collapsing the cycle. So a simple example which is not the most efficient, but is, is an example nonetheless of how to get out of a cycle is as follows. So, say we uh, enter a cycle. So, how do we know, firstly, that we've entered a cycle? Simple ways, you record the last number of elements uh, that you've uh, visited, and if you keep seeing the same elements, you know you're in the cycle. Once you know that you're in the cycle, you have to have, a, again, a de deterministic way of getting out of the cycle. So, to do that, what you can do, for example, is you can say, given that we know they're in the cycle, and we know every element in the cycle, we can find out what's the largest, say, x coordinate, if it's an elliptic curve, in that cycle. And then once you've found the element with the largest x coordinate, we can then say, we're going to take a step, a standard step, to get out of the cycle. That would mean that any other walk that enters the same cycle will use the same deterministic method of jumping out of the cycle. That way the walk is not wasted, and only a few steps are wasted. So this example is very costly, but nonetheless it's just an example, and there are better ways of doing it, as suggested by Gallup, Lambert, Banstone, and Wiener and Zuccarato. Okay, so I think I have time for some of uh, our experiment results. So we used kind of a toy example, purely because we only had one machine to do this on. Uh, the elliptic curve that we used was the one there, uh, where the, the group of uh, points on the elliptic curve were slightly bigger than 2 to 51. And we picked various interval sizes in that 2 to 51, because we're not, uh, and we ran experiments on those intervals. So the following table, if it comes up, so, so we ran experiments on intervals of 2 to the 34, 2 to the 40, and 2 to the 48, and uh, due to the time of each experiment, we ran 1,000 trials on the first, 300 on the second, and 50 on the third. Um, the first column, so that's improved GSA, that's what it... Those were the experiments completed before we submitted the paper. And then since then, we've run more experiments with uh, better uh, mean step sizes and a few more tweaks in the algorithm, but still the same algorithm nonetheless. Um, we've achieved slightly better uh, running times. The XX in the bottom corner is uh, just where the experiments are still running, and they're, they're still ongoing. 
so we're not, we haven't quite achieved the 1.36 root n uh, from the theory, but we believe that with better methods of collapsing the cycle and with um, better mean step sizes and so forth, we can achieve close to that. Okay, and then to conclude, so what we've seen is we've, I've described the DLP in an interval and that it occurs in many situations. I've um, mentioned the improved parallelized kangaroo algorithm, which solves the standard DLP in an interval in all groups, uh, in 1.71 root n steps. I've then uh, mentioned our improved Godish loss algorithm for all groups, uh, which uh, completes in 1.48 root n steps. And then I've shown uh, this new algorithm for groups with fast inversion, so the improved Godish loss algorithm using equivalence classes solves this problem in 1.36 root n steps. But with that algorithm, as we've seen, there are a few issues with the practical running of that algorithm. Okay, and that's it. Thank you.